So my sermon today is going to be based out of... <laughs> that was hilarious. You know, I, I agree, Wayne. I agree. You know, I love that we are part of a church, that we get to just laugh at stuff like that. If you're watching online and wondering what's going on, you're missing out. Just saying. So my sermon, my sermon today is, is based on, out of uh, Acts chapter 4. In Acts 4, Peter and John, uh, two of the disciples of Jesus... They've gone to the temple, and they're standing in the temple, and they're preaching the good news of Jesus. The, uh, the, the, the priests, the captain of the temple, the Sadducees, they come to these people, to Peter and John. They tell them to stop doing what they're doing, and they won't, so they throw them in jail. We pick up in verse 5 of Acts chapter 4. The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name do you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus, the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, has become the cornerstone. There is no salvation in anyone else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and ordinary men, they were amazed and recognized them as companions of Jesus. When they saw the man who had been cured standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. So they ordered them to leave the council while they discussed the matter with one another. They said, what will we do with them? It's obvious to all who live in Jerusalem that a notable sign has been done through them. We cannot deny it. But to keep it from spreading further among the people... Let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it's right in God's eyes to listen to you rather than to God, you be the judge. We cannot keep from speaking about what we have seen and heard. After threatening them again, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all of them praised God for what had happened. I love this passage of scripture. You know, a couple days ago, Lauren and I, uh, while we weren't in the hospital, uh, we were watching a television show together. And in that television show, uh, one of the characters uh, was, was beginning to get ready to go off to college. The, the dad was, uh, you know, imagining life without his daughter who would be going off to college. And I will admit that it made me start doing some math. And it's like, oh my goodness. And Nine or ten years, Nathaniel will be at the age where he's, if he's not going to college, he's at least moving out of my house. That's, right, that's what I think. <laughs> and it made me begin to think about college. I leaned over to Lauren and I said, do you miss, what do you miss most about college? If anything. She said, well, I miss being independent, which I took a little personally. Um... <laughs> She said, no, I, I miss, you know, it was fun that you're like around your friends all the time. You're, you're growing, you're, you're able to do fun things with your friends whenever you want. And then she looked at me and said, what do you miss? You probably miss like going to class and stuff, don't you? And I was like, a little. I miss going to class. I loved class. Lauren used to get mad at me because she couldn't talk me into skipping class. I was like, I don't have a good reason to skip class. What are you talking about? I'm not doing that. Made me start thinking about the professors and the classes that I took and maybe it's just because it's college season here in Madison, right? 
It's, it's the time of year where our campus ministries that we support and are part of, they're, they're launching their fall you know, startups. They're getting ready for the influx of students. Madison, you know, our, our population is about to like go up by 25% as 40 some thousand college students get going on their classes. I know that we have people here who are in classes getting ready to go. Something about September always gives me the warm fuzzies, and I will admit that it's weird for me when I don't get a syllabus emailed to me. My, I've been done with my master's degree for like four years, and I'm still like, ooh, do I need school supplies? <laughs> I don't. It was funny, too. The other day, I was talking to Caleb. I, we were watching, I think we were watching a baseball game, and I just occasionally like to ask my kids what they want to be when they grow up because it often leads to fun conversations. I ask Caleb, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he goes, I don't want to go to college. I was like, well, that's not what I asked. <laughs> I said, well, that's okay. You know, I try to be a supportive dad. You don't, you don't have to go to college. Like, and I started listing some of you all who I know didn't go to college and were successful at what you do. I said, do you know so-and-so? They didn't go to college. Your uncle, he didn't go to college, and he's doing fine. So what do, you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And then he was like, well, I want to be an inventor. And I was like, well, you may need math school for some of that, you know? Like, I want to be an engineer. Like, well, we got to talk about school again now. There's something about college, though, that just makes me feel a certain way. I was, some of you know that I, I teach about once a season, once in the fall, once in the spring. I teach over at City Church on the east side. They have an Associates of Arts degree that they offer uh, through what's called Christian Life College, where part of what they do is they have uh, local uh, pastors who have, uh, you know, advanced, you know, master's degree or higher who come in and teach for them so that they can teach students about the Bible and about how to do ministry as a way to equip the next generation of ministers. And it's one of the, the favorite things that I get to do kind of in the community. And I had to laugh because they asked me to be part of a promotional video that they were making. They said, hey, we'd love to interview some of our professors and, and, and just kind of record your responses to some questions. And they said, one of the first questions they asked was, why is, uh, why is higher Christian education important? And I said, well, you may not like my answer. I said, I don't think it's necessary. I said, my conviction as somebody who has a master's of divinity, who has a bachelor of arts in Bible, who has, you know, I, I love school, but my conviction is that we are qualified by Christ, not by our degree. I said, well, I, the reason that I think higher education is helpful or important is that it makes us better at times, but it's not required. I liken our uh, educational system to an incubator. Right? Incubators help things grow fast. They give them the right uh, you know, uh, environment so that we can have rapid growth. And what I have discovered in my life is that my education helped me grow quickly, gave me a little bit of accountability. We would often say that I'm in school because it forces me to read the things that I want to read <laughs> that I wouldn't read without a grade. Why do I think that our higher education is helpful but not important? Because of Acts chapter 4, verse 13. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and ordinary, they were amazed. And they recognized them as companions of Jesus. We're told that Peter and John, they're uneducated and ordinary. I, I, this is like, I, would, I love this. I hope that's what's on their, you know, their tombstone, wherever it is, uneducated and ordinary. I love that this is how they are so obviously uneducated. 
We're not told how the, how the Pharisees, Sadducees, whoever, they, they apparently just look at him and they're like, you uneducated northerners. Like something about them, they just know that they're uneducated. They look at him and they go, these guys are ordinary. Why are they schooling us? Right, because what's important is that they quote a psalm. They have immediately connected Jesus to this ancient wisdom on the stone the builders rejected. To some degree, they're, they're a little taken aback because they've never had fishermen speak so boldly to the religious leaders. Right? I mean, Peter effectively mic drops in this, right? He's like, hey, we're preaching about Jesus, you know, the guy that you killed. The guy that every one of you said, kill him. That's who we're preaching for because he was raised. They're like, who is this guy? Who, who are you? These guys are uneducated and ordinary, we're told. Effectively, what, what we're being told in this by Luke is that the Sadducees, the, the teachers of the law, they looked at these guys and said, they don't meet our qualifications. If they were put up to be on this council, we'd laugh at them. They don't meet our qualifications. They haven't, they haven't gone through our schooling. They, they didn't even use the right verb tense there. I don't know how, again, something about how they talk lets the Pharisees and Sadducees know that they're ordinary and uneducated. Have you ever been in a period where you feel um, let's say unqualified somebody comes to you and they go hey why does this happen why did that happen maybe uh, you know maybe you are like us Lauren and I where you know we go to the hospital and we're like so you're telling me two minutes apart contractions I'm supposed to be here but we've been here six times now. I feel like maybe you're unqualified. We don't say that, but uh, <laughs> we, say that on the, we say that on the walk out. Uh, maybe, for those of us parents, you've had those questions that kids ask like, where do babies come from? <sighs> ask your other parent. Ask your dad. Ask your mom. Or perhaps more appropriately for Lauren and I this week, Lauren's great-grandmother, she's 97. She's getting ready to go into assisted living. That's right, at 97, she's just getting ready for that. And she made a comment recently that she feels like the end is near. And we had to talk to our kids about what that meant we had to coach them through the sorrow that they have that for Nathaniel and Caleb, this will be the first grandparent, their great, great grandmother will be the first grandparent that they lose that they knew well. And you feel kind of unqualified in those moments to coach them through those emotions, those feelings, their own fears of death. It's hard for them to understand how anybody wants to die, let alone a 97-year-old widow who's lost two of her own children already. We've all been in situations where we feel unqualified for the answers or for the questions that have been asked of us. We've all been in a situation, whether they come to us readily or not, we have all been in a situation where we look back and go, I was not qualified to answer that question, I'm reminded of a time when I was uh, doing ministry in New Hampshire. Our church, uh, met, my, my church met in a boys and girls club. We rented space from them. And so I would volunteer at the boys and girls club once a week as a way to, you know, just kind of have a, my finger on the pulse of the community that we were serving. On my very first day in the homework room, I was coloring a picture next to a little boy who had finished his homework and we were just talking and he turned and looked at me. This is the first thing he said to me. He said, my dad died this summer. What? And the guy who was the, the, the staff member in there 
mouthed the words to me, overdose. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not qualified for this. What, what do I do in that situation? How do I, how do I talk to an eight-year-old about their dad? The point is that we've all been in those situations, whether they're big or small or somewhere in between. But us, we, like Peter and John, have a resource at our disposal the Holy Spirit. We're told in this passage that Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit. He's he's, he's before these people and he's not sure what he's going to say. And so I, I imagine that Peter says a very quick prayer and the Holy Spirit comes upon him and he launches into a sermon. And now they're like, whoa, who's this guy? And I love that what the what the, what the council sees about, Jesus, about these two guys. They say, these guys are ordinary. They are uneducated. But they are companions of Jesus. Right? They're the epithet for, for those two. It better not just say uneducated and ordinary. The second line reads, companion of Jesus. You see, because of their companionship, because of their with Jesusness, because of the fact that they had spent years of their life following this guy. And, and I love that the Gospels, they so often, they, they show us the disciples going, Jesus, how do we do that? How do we, do, wait a minute, how do we do that? There are a couple times in the Gospels where they come back to Jesus and they go, okay, Jesus, we tried that thing you did and it didn't work. How come? Why couldn't we cast that demon out? Why couldn't we do this thing? Why couldn't we? Why don't we pray like you do? Why? And Jesus' answer is, come follow me. I'll show you. I'll show you. I I will show you how to do this. You see, Jesus didn't just lecture his disciples. He modeled life. There's a a, a book that I read years ago called Practicing the Way of Jesus, written by a guy named Mark uh, Scandrett. Um, And my favorite thing about this book was that it talks about how um, if if we were to, to talk about the kind of teacher that Jesus is, Jesus is more like a martial arts sensei who runs a dojo than he is a lecturer in a college university. Because Jesus is the kind of teacher who he shows you the motions and then he says, you do it. And he says, okay, you did that a little wrong. They go like this. I'm, can you tell I've never done karate? Thank you, Heidi. I've never done karate. (laughs) Jesus, he shows them the motions. He says, okay, now you try. Okay, we're going to do it again. And we're going to do it again. We're going to do it again. We're going to do it again. You see, it was the companionship with Jesus that qualified them. It wasn't their education. It wasn't their extraordinariness. It wasn't that they were smarter than anybody else. It wasn't that they were better looking than anyone else. It wasn't that they were richer than anyone else. It wasn't anything that we might say that would make them extraordinary. Whatever extraordinary means to you, they weren't it. They weren't it. But they were companions of Jesus. Now, let me be very clear. I want to reiterate, okay? I think that education is helpful. <laughs> I'm glad that you know, we, we live in a, in a world that, that lets us make education for especially young people accessible. So I'm not knocking you know, going to school, okay? Not, not doing that. I just think it makes us better at times. It, it accelerates the growth at times. But I want you to understand that you don't have to go to Bible college to convert someone to Jesus. You don't have to go to Bible college. You don't ever have to take a single Bible class 
You don't have to know how to read Greek or read Hebrew or you don't know how to, you don't even know how, have to know how to preach a sermon. You don't know you don't have to know this stuff in order to lead your neighbor to Jesus. You don't have to you don't have to have any kind of education. You are a companion of Jesus. You are qualified by what Jesus did. As Anne said in her prayer for us, none of us are perfect, but thanks be to God that Jesus was. Thanks be to God that, the, that our Savior was. Because it's through Jesus that we can do these things. It's not our qualifications, it's His. It's not our Quali you know, our achievements. It's God's. We were talking in Sunday school today about Moses in, Ex in Exodus chapters 3 and 4, where Moses makes, I think, we, we count five excuses that Moses makes to God about why he's not a good pick. And the last one I, we love is, it's, I, I don't want to. Like, I don't want to lead those people. But Moses has five reasons that he can think of why he's a bad pick to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. And he doesn't even mention the fact that he's an orphan who was adopted by an Egyptian with an Egyptian name who murdered another Egyptian. Like he's a murderer. But God goes, no, 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 it's okay. You're going to be the guy who I give the law to. But that wasn't unique to Moses. Abraham and his wife, Sarah... My Abraham was a liar. He was a Babylonian himself. He had grown up worshiping other gods. And they were infertile. They were wrestling with fertility. And God goes, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And Sarah's like, now? You're going to start this now? I am old. David was a shepherd boy, nobody, youngest of his family. Certainly not a very good dad. Had marital issues. Effectively a murderer. He was kind of a predator. The story of Scripture is full of God using people who are absolutely undoubtedly flawed. So I don't care what you think your flaw is. If the Pharisees or Sadducees looked at you, I don't care what your blank and blank flaw might be. Maybe you go, well, I am educated and I am extraordinary, so here I am. Pick two different flaws. I don't care. Whatever, the, whatever your flaws are, the point is that you can still have the companionship with Jesus. You don't have to be extraordinary. You don't have to be a good pick. All right, we were joking today that if Moses had submitted his resume to God, like it would have quickly gone in the trash, right? Like, like that's, that's the resume you laugh at, you email to your coworker, and you go, thanks, we're going a different direction. But the point is, that his qualification was that he was willing to be a companion of God. Abraham was willing to be a companion of God. David was called a man for God's own heart, despite the fact that he was messed up. The point is that there are, it is possible to be a flawed person and a companion of Jesus, and thanks be to God that our companionship with Jesus is what gives us qualities of leadership or prestige in the world to speak like they did. Prestige is the wrong word. The, the power to speak as they did. You see, the, the problem is that sometimes we get devoted to companionship with the wrong thing. I, I will confess to you that I, I again, I, I said it before, I like education. I like, to, I like to read. I like taking classes. And if I'm honest with you, sometimes I will explain my faith in the words of other people who I'm 
reading? Well, according to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, it's... According to David Bentley Hart, it's... According to Thomas Aquinas, it's... According to Ann Voskamp, it's this. According to Shauna Nyquist, it's this. According to... Brother Lawrence, it's... Right? Don't get me wrong. I think it's helpful to read and be aware of those. Uh, that's helpful for me. But my companionship, I have to be careful. I have to be sure that my companionship is ultimately with Jesus and not other servants of Jesus. My companionship ultimately must be with Christ. My first friend must be Jesus. My best friend is Jesus. You know, back when I was in middle school, we had MySpace where you could, you know, rank your top eight friends for everyone to see online. You want to know why we have social problems in America? This is why. I'm just saying. You can, you know, put your top friends and Jesus should be number one, right? That's what we're told. And the question that I want us to ask ourselves today is, when people look at us, do they see us as companions of Jesus? When they look at us, we get so focused on what's the, what's the negative they see about me? I'm uneducated, I'm ordinary, I'm poor, I'm this, I'm that. We can get so worried in the negative, but I want us to ask the question, do we look like, do we appear as, are we perceived as companions of Jesus? Does the way that we talk to our spouse or about our spouse communicate our companionship with Jesus? Does the way that we handle our children's misbehavior in public and in private communicate companionship with Jesus? Does the way that we talk to and about our co-workers communicate companionship with Jesus? Does the way that we interact with our neighbors communicate companionship with Jesus? Does the way that we walk through life communicate companionship with Jesus? Does the way that we drive on the belt line communicate companionship with Jesus? Does the way that our life is patterned communicate companionship with Jesus? Right now in our, our lower level, our children um, are learning about that Romans passage that we read earlier today, and they're learning about loving our enemies, a truly mind-blowing aspect of our faith. Do you know that the only way that you can love your enemy is by companionship with Christ? The only, I, I, I've never met anybody who wasn't a Christian who was able to love their enemy. I just haven't. Maybe you know one. Prove me wrong. That's fine. I'm just saying that the way that we do the kinds of things that Paul talks about in that passage, they're only possible as companions of Christ. In order for us to live like Paul encourages and exhorts us, I think that we have to live our lives with Jesus. And the good news about that is that if we do that, it doesn't matter how qualified the world thinks we are. Because we're told that God looks at us and he says, wow, you're Jesus. You, you put Jesus on today. You put Jesus on today. You're a companion of Jesus. Let's go change the world. I don't care that you're flawed. I don't care that you're broken. You can do it with me. When we look at our flaws, it's really easy to be overcome. Get maybe nihilistic. What's the use? I'm no good at blank. And I want to give you, I want to end today with the words that God gave to Paul. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. What that means is no flaw of yours is bigger than God's grace. No flaw of yours is a bigger problem 
than God can handle. No flaw of yours can outdo your companionship with Christ. And so I invite you to make Christ your companion. Let's pray. Thanks, God, for giving us a friend like Jesus. Thanks, God, for giving us Jesus who we can follow, who we can be companions with, who will give us the quality that we can't have on our own. God, we are qualified by him. We are qualified by what he has done. We are qualified by what he is doing and what he will do in our lives. And God, we simply marvel at that good news. God, I pray that you would turn us into companions of Christ, that we would daily find ways to follow after Jesus, that we would walk through life with him. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.